Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and lately I've been trying out V Rising. It's an excellent vampire survival game that released a while ago. It's exactly the kind of game that I like. There's resource gathering, crafting, some nice combat, building, and so on. As you can guess by the name, it's all about vampires. You play as a vampire, and the game features many interesting vampire mechanics taken from the usual vampire myths. So, for example, there are silver coins in the world. Vampires are weak to silver, so if you pick up some coins, you won't be constantly taking damage. There's also a feed mechanic, so when an enemy is weakened, you can jump on them and feast on their blood. Doing so grants some interesting bonuses based on the quality and the type of blood. Another obvious one is garlic. There are some garlic defenses in the world, and you need to basically buff up your garlic resistance before you can enter that area. The game also has interesting faction mechanics, so if a group of skeletons comes across some humans in the open world, they won't start to fight. It's really fun to just sit back, fire some projectiles, and watch as two enemy factions destroy one another while you sit back and go in the end and just pick up all the loot. There's also a pretty robust base building system. You can place down areas in a grid, then place down walls and doors, and inside your castle you can then place down crafting stations, chests, and so on. It works pretty much exactly like what I've already covered in my house building system video, so if you want to learn how to make something like that, go watch that one. So there's lots of interesting mechanics in V Rising. Now here for this video, the mechanic that I'd like to recreate is a pretty unique one that requires some clever trickery. It's the sunlight mechanic. As you might know, a big part of being a vampire is avoiding sunlight. The game itself has a day-night cycle. When it's nighttime, you can go anywhere without any issues. However, when it's daylight, if you stay in the sun for too long, then the sun starts to burn you and take quite a lot of damage. If you don't find cover quickly, then you will die. Thankfully, the world is filled with tons of trees, rocks, and buildings, so you can jump around between the shadows to move during the day. This is a really interesting, unique mechanic that perfectly fits the theme of this game. So let's see how it actually works and how we can recreate it, which involves some clever trickery. And if you like this format and want to learn more about how to recreate various systems from interesting games, then check out the entire How It's Made playlist, learn how the Scout Probe Launcher from Outer Wild works, learn how to clean a mesh like in Rover Mechanic Simulator, learn how to interact with worm objects and scan things like in Cyberpunk, or several others. Okay, so here I've got a working demo recreating that mechanic. I have my basic player character and I can walk around. If you want to know about the character controller, this one is based on Unity's official third-person controller, just with an overhead camera. And for the assets, both the background and the character are from the Sinti Horror Pack. It's a really great pack with some spooky vibes, obviously perfect for this video. And actually, right now, this pack is discounted as part of a huge Sinti sale. It's their anniversary, and pretty much every single pack is at half price, really great. So if you're a fan of their style just like me, then check the link in the description. They have asset packs to cover pretty much any game or theme. Now, by inspecting the game, we can look at the core components that make up this mechanic. First one is really just the day-night cycle. I've been meaning to make a tutorial on how to make a day-night cycle for quite some time. Still haven't done it, but it's actually pretty simple. The main thing is really you just need to keep track of time. For that, over here I've got my script, the sunlight system, and as you can see, I'm using a float to store the daytime. So it's just a simple float, and then down here on update, on every update, I'm constantly increasing that one by time dot the time. And in order to make it loop, after increasing it, I just use the modulo operator and some kind of daytime max. Now for here, the maximum amount is arbitrary. You can make it a normalized value, or use 12 or 24, or literally anything you want. For this case, I simply went with 24 just to match the hours. So with this logic, each day is going to last 24 seconds. Then of course, you can also apply just a basic multiplier if you want to make it faster or slower. So if I put the multiplier and define it as 0.5, then each day is now going to last 48 seconds. Then this case to convert daytime into hours, since I made the maximum as 24. With that, I can just do a floor to end to get the hour. So if I do a simple debug log to get the hour, if we see what this says, there it is on the console, constantly increasing. And as soon as it reaches the end, the 24 hours, because we're using the module, it loops back into zero and continues the next day. So that's really all you need to define the logic for the day-night cycle. Then this case for this game, for the vampire game, it is crucial that we know what is daytime and what is nighttime. And of course, since the goal is you want to be playing at night, since that's when you're most powerful. Because of that, the game doesn't have a realistic day-night cycle. So instead of something like 16 hours of daytime and only eight hours of night, you have pretty much the opposite. So over here, just a super basic if, just get the hours, if it's above 4 and less than 11, if so, then consider daytime. Anything else, it's nighttime. Okay, so that handles the basic float logic to keep track of time, and for the visual, it's also pretty simple. I just made them using a very simple animation. So over here on the directional light, I've got a standard light, so everything's pretty standard, then I've got an animator, and on the animator, I've got an animation, 
And as you can see, as I move the animation, there you go. It just flips around, changes the color and so on. So you can see in scene view, there it is. Here is the directional light. So on the animation, pretty much just rotating around, going back and forth and so on. And then over here on the light, we can see the filter and the temperature. So at nighttime, got a very cold color and pulls the filter just to make it even more blue. And then as the sun starts coming up, there you go, the temperature goes up, the filter goes into white, then just stays there for a little bit, and then once again moves, and you can see the shadows. So for the visual, it really is as simple as this. One more thing for this cycle, like I saw in the script, I'm using a certain multiplier. So we're here to control the animation. First of all, I define the animation exactly the same as I defined the default maximum. So I define it with 24 seconds, and over here on the animation, this one does last for exactly 24 seconds. And then on the animator itself, over here, I've got just one animation. And crucially, one thing that you might not know, the animator actually has a really nice multiplier field, and that field can be based on a parameter. So what I did is on the animator, I defined a daytime multiplier, and it's being applied onto this animation. Then here on the script, I've got a reference to the day-night cycle animator, and on awake, I simply go in there and I modify the flow to what I have over here. Say if I want the day to be super fast, let's say I put four in here. And yep, with that, both the logic and the animations, they're both perfectly correct. Then the final visual is just over here, the clock. So it rotates around when it's daytime, the color changes. Doing that is super simple. I've just got a basic canvas inside. I've got a game object containing all of the elements. I've got a background, then a whole bunch of text objects for all of the various numbers. And then I just have the hand, which inside has the actual sprite. I made it a child sprite so I can modify the pivot position. If you don't know how to do that, I actually made a video a super long time ago, but it's super useful to know. Basically just offset the child in order to modify the pivot on the parent. So with this one, on the parent, I can simply rotate over here on the Z axis and I can rotate the clock around. Then here for the script controlling it is super simple. Literally just grabs the reference to the hand transform and modifies the Euler angles to rotate it. Just goes into the sunlight system, accesses the instance in order to ask for the daytime normalized and multiplies it by 360 degrees. Then also asks if it's daytime, if so, change the background color to the day color, if not, change to the night color. All of it is really pretty simple, and here it is, the element in action. So it's rotating around, and in a bit, there you go, yep, it suddenly turns into sunlight. Okay, so these are all the things that make up a basic day-night cycle. Now for the really important part about this mechanic, we need to identify when the player is being hit by sunlight. So when does the player in shadow, and when are they in sunlight? Now doing this is actually something that is seemingly simple, but it's actually quite a bit complex. Now you might immediately have guessed the straightforward approach, that would be using a raycast, you know where the player exists, so you can simply spawn a raycast right from the player position, fire it towards the sky, so there you go, just in there. Technically that would work, fire the raycast towards the sun, and if there's nothing blocking, then the player's in the sun. If there is something blocking, like for example a tree, then the player's in the shade. So you would think that would work. However, in most games, the physics shape of objects does not match the visual shape. For example, here on this demo, I've got all kinds of trees and objects. They all have colliders on them. If I try moving, there you go, I cannot go through the tree, the tree trunk is solid. However, if we inspect the tree to look at it, we can see that it does have a very basic collider. This one is using a simple capsule collider and not something that actually has the shape of the mesh. So the collider shape does not match the visual shape. And this is exactly what you should do. Now technically, you could swap out this collider for a mesh collider and then the raycast method would work, but having mesh colliders on every single object Especially when using it on complex objects like this tree with tons of tiny leaves, using that would massively tank your game's performance. Look at the massive difference in the complex of the actual shape, and even with that we can see that the mesh collider, it would simply not function if it had the exact same shape as the object, so even that one isn't really accurate. So because of those reasons, that is why the obvious approach of using a raycast and colliders, that is why that would not work. But instead, we can use the next obvious approach, which is perhaps even more obvious, which is we can literally look at the sun from the point of view of the player. If we can visually see the sun, then that means there's nothing blocking it, so we must be in sunlight. And if not, then we must be in the shade. So that is the approach that I took, and over here on the player game object, inside it I have a second camera. Here it is, the check sunlight camera. Now this one is not rendering to the screen, instead it is rendering onto a render texture. Now if you don't know about render textures, I made a full video on them. They are super useful for making really interesting use cases like this one. So the camera output goes onto this texture, and then for this texture, for the settings, over here I made it with a pretty small size and zero anti-aliasing. Then for the camera background, if we look at it, over here for the environment, for the background type, I went with a solid color and I chose a really nice green. So the goal was if the camera can see this color, then that means looking at the sky. Although that method wasn't actually working too well, 
It has to do with how the background color is still affected by the sunlight color. So for the final result, I still went with a solid color, but more importantly, I set the alpha on zero. And since I only care about a single pixel, that is why the render texture over here is super tiny. And again, since all I want is really just look straight at the sun, because of that over here, the field of view is also super tiny. I can increase to see what this camera sees, and there you go, that's what it sees. Let's look at it in play mode. So put the camera side by side. So with this, yep, there you go, as the sun rotates on the sky, so does this camera, so it's always pointing towards the sun. And as I move, there you go. If it can see the sunlight, there you go, I'm in sun. If not, then I'm in the shade. And of course, again, this whole thing works with just one FOV. One final thing that I also had to change is over here on the camera, we've got the clipping planes. So the camera just starts seeing at this distance and only sees up until this distance. Now, if I put this at zero, then the whole thing breaks because the camera is in there, but it's actually looking at the hat. That is not what we want. We want to see if we can look at the sky from outside the character. So that is why over here, I set a nice tiny offset so that the camera starts viewing just from up here. So that's really it for the camera setup. It's just a second camera that is rendering with a super tiny FOV, rendering onto a texture with a specific color that has alpha of zero. Then the camera has this simple script attached to it. Over here, it has a reference to the sun, which is the directional light. Then it also grabs the camera target texture. Then down here, I have a function to test if this camera, if this character is catching sunlight. And really what it does is just calls the read pixels functions in order to read the pixels from the render texture onto a regular texture. Now, if you don't know about this method, if you don't understand what this is doing, then go watch my video on how to take a screenshot. That's pretty much what it's doing here. It creates a new texture based on the render texture, then just reads the pixels. So it reads the pixels from this texture onto this texture. Then with that, to get the sky color, I just call get pixel on zero zero to get the sky color. And then here, like I mentioned, I tested out two different approaches. For the first one, I want to grab this pixel and compare this pixel. So get the color difference between the sky color and the camera background color. And to do that, instead of using just a simple equals, since colors are really floats, so you should never compare float directly to another float. Floats have limited precision, so you should never ever compare them directly. So to compare these two colors, I simply made this function. It's a super useful function that is part of my utilities. So basically what it does just gets all the difference for all the colors. So the R, G, B, and A just gets the total difference for all of those, sums them all up and just returns it. Then over here, I can just test the difference max. So if it's under a certain maximum, then I consider that the same color, which in this case would mean that it's looking at the sky. However, like I said, with this method, I was getting some inconsistent results. It has to do with how direct and intense the sunlight is. If it is too intense, then the camera differs from the background color by quite a lot. So instead of comparing colors, I just went with the second method where literally all I test is just the sky color alpha. Basically, all of the objects in the game, they have some alpha, they're all solid. So if this camera is looking at an object that has no alpha, then I can be pretty sure that it's looking at the sky. And the final thing to make all this work is really just looking straight towards the sun. Now here, you might think that you can, instead of doing this, just do a simple transform.lookat. You might think that you can do this. This one takes a target for the target transform position. However, directional lights don't really work like that. They don't work based on the position. You can move them, you can place them anywhere. The actual position of this game object has no impact at all. The directional light only takes the rotation into account. So in this case, in order to keep it clean, I left the position on 0, 0, 0. So if I had the camera looking straight towards there, then it would be looking towards that position instead of looking towards the sun in the sky. So that is why you cannot just do a transform that look at and look at that game object. Instead, you have to take the directional light, grab the lights, transform forward, which is where the light is pointing, and then you just invert it and set this one to that. With that, here it is in the game. So I'll look at as how the light rotates around the sky. As it moves around, you can see the camera is always perfectly pointing. And finally, for testing, I also made this super simple debug element. This one is set up as a world space canvas, which is super useful. Check out my video on them if you've never used a world space canvas. Like I said, really useful for adding UI elements onto the world. So in this case, I just add this one, and then inside, I just have a very basic image. Then on this world UI, I simply have this script. And this script really just has the check sunlight camera. Ask it, is it catching sunlight? If so, change the color to the day color or the night color. So with that, I can walk around. I've got this nice debug visual that is telling me here I'm in sunlight, and if I go into the shade, there you go, now I'm in the shade. Now, the final thing to make this work is just some basic logic and effects. For the logic, here is the sunlight system script. Then I've got this function to try to deal sunlight damage, and this function is running on every single update. And over here, the first thing that checks is it daytime. So that function, once again, just has the hour. So if so, then it's in daytime. It checks if it's daytime, and then also asks the check sunlight camera as if the player is catching sunlight. If so, then it just increases a very basic timer by how long the player has been in sunlight. 
And if this if is false, so if it's not daytime or the player is not catching sunlight, if so, then we just reset the timer. And for the visuals, I just have two basic particle systems. So this one just has a handful of particles, so the particles are flying away and they've got a nice trail, so it looks pretty nice. And the second one is pretty much the same thing, but a lot more intense. And again, they also have a simple script doing the same thing to make sure that it looks straight towards the sun. Then back in the logic, I just have references to those two. So the first one activates if the player has been in sunlight for more than 15% of the maximum time, and the second one activates after 50%, and if the player is still there after the maximum amount of time, then so the player starts taking damage. For damage over here I'm using my own super useful health system that I've been using for many years. I've used this in pretty much all of my Steam games, and a while ago I made it into a proper asset, so check it out if you want a simple, easy to use and fully featured health system. It's completely free, so feel free to use it in your own projects. And finally, the logic also grabs the post processing volume and modifies the weight. So over here, I've got a separate game object with a post processing volume. This is a second one, so I've got the main one. Over here is the main post processing volume, so with the main effects. And then I've got a second one. This one just increased the bloom and increased the color gain. This one has a higher priority than the other one, so this one has a priority of 0, and the burning one has a priority of 10. And then on that script, all I'm doing is over here modifying the weight. So if the player is not taking damage, then we've got the regular view. And as soon as the player starts taking damage, then we increase the weight on this one. There you go, it looks really intense. Okay, so with that, here is the final mechanic. Now, if it's nighttime, I can walk around anywhere. I can look at the clock to see when it's nighttime and when it's daytime. So after a while, there you go, it does become daytime. I'm currently in the sun. And there you go, it starts to become much more intense. And after a while, I'm going to, yep, there you go, I start taking damage. So I better run away, get into some shade. And there you go, in the shade, I'm safe, even though it's daytime. When it's nighttime, once again, I can walk around anywhere and the day-night cycle continues to loop and loop. So here I can run around anywhere, I can go anywhere I want. And now it's about to become daytime, so I better run away, I better get in the shade, and there I go, even though it's daytime. Over here in the shade I'm fine, and if I go outside, there I go, now I'm going to burn. All right, awesome. So this mechanic is really interesting, it's really awesome, making this was pretty fun. Learning how to use the camera to build this was a nice fun challenge to complete. So here it is, my recreation of the V-Rising sunlight system, and I hope you learned something with it. Also, if you want to learn more about how the game actually works, the developers actually did a really in-depth interview with Unity on Twitch. They opened up the project and showcased various interesting things for how it works. Definitely go watch that if you want to learn more about how this game works. It's always great to see the behind the scenes of games made with Unity that turned out to be excellent games and find massive success. And again, if you want to learn how to recreate various systems from interesting games, then check out the How It's Made playlist. Learn how to make the Scout Probe Launcher from Other Wilds. Learn how to clean a mesh like in Rover Mechanic Simulator learn how to interact with world objects and scan things like in Cyberpunk, and many others. And finally, if you're still watching this video to the end, then thank you, and I actually have a gift for you. For some reason, the V-Rising devs added my email to their email list. Now, I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe they confused my channel for a more game-playing channel instead of game dev. Or perhaps, since the game is made with Unity, someone from the team might have learned something from my videos and they intentionally added it to the list. Anyways, whatever the reason was, they sent me a bunch of Steam keys. So as a thank you for sticking with the video to the end, if you want to get the game, here's some Steam keys. If you picked them up, just let me know in the comments. Only about 5 to 10 people watch the videos to the end, so this is a nice gift for you. I hope you'll enjoy the game just like I did. Alright, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.